welcome to We Never Met, the podcast where I have interesting strangers on every single week. Today, we have Joshua Burnside all the way from Northern Ireland. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Nice to <laughs> got, you. got you mid-sip. Mid-sip, yeah. I, just yeah. Had a, I thought your intro was going to be longer, so I had a big sip <laughs> of uh, green tea there. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. So just to get into it and to sort of give people more of a background on on you and what you do could you give people just a sense of uh what you're doing right now i mean we're all sort of doing the same same thing right now but um what you do on a day-to-day basis i have a little studio space in in belfast uh, as part of a art collective called uh vault vault artists in belfast who um sort of take over like abandoned buildings and turn them into art studios that are like, really cheap. So um, thankfully I can go there every day and, and, and make noises and make music. And uh, it's uh, it's my place of work and it's uh, my sort of second home. So if I'm not at home here where I am now, I'll, I'll be in there just banging away and making as much noise as, I, as I'm, I'm allowed to. So yeah. <laughs> Without getting kicked out or anything? Yeah. Without getting kicked out. No, I'm, I'm quite fortunate that I can kind of make as much noise as I want in there. Which yeah. is nice. Do you, so do, were you born and raised in Belfast? Um, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, I was born in Lisburn, which is a little sort of, which is a city next to Belfast. Um, I don't know if you could call it a city and really, it's just a, a, a big town that someone decided to call it. Sure. And, uh, I grew, and I grew up sort of in the country, in the countryside, just on the outskirts sort of Belfast in Cumber and Lisbon. So, but I'd be in Belfast a lot growing up and I, I, I think of Belfast as my home, but I sort of have dual sort of feelings about, I'm sort of a country, country boy, but I'm also a city, city kid as well. Bit of both. Yeah. Cause I actually, I lived in Ireland for six months. I lived in Limerick yeah. and yeah, it's, it's just a beautiful, I, I didn't make it up to Northern Ireland. It's just a beautiful place to live. I assume that the the culture there, like the, the, the pub culture and the music culture and really shaped how your music is, is made or, or your background in music. Is that the case for you? Yeah, I'd say the, it'd be a big influence for me growing up. It's a pretty musical place. And, uh, I, I do try and draw on the sort of musical heritage of the island because there is a sort of rich heritage, musical heritage there, uh, musical and literary, you know, try and, steal as much as I can and absorb as much as I can and refashion it all in, in, in my own, in my own way. Cause when were you were growing up, was it, was it something that was on the table for you? Like being a musician and being a singer songwriter, was that something that you thought was feasible and like you could do? That's a good question. I think I was always very much encouraged to play music and to create music and people around me were always very like encouraging, but I never really thought of it as a proper career or like a proper job or something. I never took it seriously in that regard for a long time. It was only only in the last sort of five, five, five or six years that I've been like, okay, this is this is my my thing now. That I this is my sort of job. Yeah. But I mean, I don't like don't really try and think of it in those terms too much because I feel like that might suck the the joy out of it. I, I'm I'm really lucky in that this is what I get to do um, to make to make a bit of bit of money and yeah I'm very grateful. Because like what what changed for you? What made like the five or six years ago? What changed um, to go into like this more full time? Like what was it a change in mindset or just something that happened? Yeah, I think I, I met my previous manager. Um, he was, he was a, a brilliant man called Lyndon Stevens who he passed away just over a year ago and he was sort of the guy who said you can do this properly and you can do it right and I'm going to give you a hand and he signed me to his little label his independent label called Quiet Arch and he just thought with his encouragement and his sort of intellect and business sort of mind that he was able to kind of show me that that it was worth it was something worth doing so I am very grateful for for that yeah cuz i mean i i personally love your music i got introduced through Spotify through the discover weekly playlist. But yeah, so I just started going through your whole catalog. And what I noticed is that it's like very eclectic. You know, it seems like a lot of the times when people like write up things about musicians, they want to like put them in a certain space or whatever, but you seem to like dabble in everything. (laughs) Like one song can be completely different than, than the next. 
is that a reflection of like how you grew up or what music you were exposed to at a young age? Um, yeah, I think so. I think I partly in that, um, I kind of get bored pretty quick playing something that's mine similar to something else. So I kind of sure. jump around and I've found it to be, yeah, it's funny. Some people say like some people like that and some people don't, I don't, I don't think I don't have a very consistent sound and at times that can be kind of off putting, I think to people that I can, but, um, other people appreciate that. And, uh, I'm always jumping and trying to find something that excites me. And if that happens to be a completely different sound and style and rhythm and instrumentation than the thing I was doing a week ago, then, then I can do that. Cause I'm not, I don't feel like I'm tied to a particular genre or I'm tied to a particular sound. I just want to express myself. And if one day I feel like this thing needs to have, you know, steel drums and bazookies and, and uh shaker and, sweet and the next day i feel like this needs to be like a sad piano ballad and cool yeah i, I think if when you're i think i'm more and more artists are like that because you're not as uh maybe if you're if you're more reliant on a band sort of situation where it has to have this you're relying on certain other musicians to come in and do their thing that it becomes a more consistent sort of sound but is that sort of what drew you because you you lived in colombia right is that like the change of pace is that sort of what drew you to move down there for a bit and like record? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that was a big influence on my first album because I was kind of surrounding myself in that culture and that music and um, I definitely took bits and pieces from that. But I, I mean, I'm always kind of trying to absorb as much as possible from everywhere I go and I love to travel and I love to hear different music in different places and meet different people. And yeah, the more you try and kick in and listen, like I feel like the the richer the the thing that you're going to come out with is hopefully, um, hopefully it doesn't just sign to it just like nonsense when it comes out. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause how did that how did that whole uh, trip even come about? Like, what, were you just like one day I'm going to move there? <laughs> let let's just do that. No, I I had cousins who were living there. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know why they moved there, uh, <laughs> but yes, they lived there, and I'm. So I knew I had a place to stay if I wanted to. So that was quite fortunate. And were you, was it uh, with the intent to write music or you just wanted to explore it and it just sort of happened that way? I just wanted to explore. I think uh, I was living in Glasgow for a long time and I kind of thought I needed to get out of there after a while. I was kind of sort of in a rut a wee bit. And um, although I love Glasgow and I love the people and, and I had a lot of good friends there, but I wasn't writing a lot of music and I wasn't doing yeah I wasn't doing a lot of gigs so I feel like I needed a change of scenery to kind of uh kick start my sort of creative creative side to me I guess yeah because I haven't I haven't been to Scotland but it there is there a lot of more rain than Ireland there is it more like <laughs> does it have more depressing winters than it does in Ireland um I'd say it's probably roughly the same to be honest okay um I don't think any country has the monopoly on crap weather. It's all pretty crap run <laughs> on yeah. Scotland, Scotland and Ireland. I think um, there is something about Glasgow that can be a bit claustrophobic in the way mm. it's situated. Where, like the grey skies feel very close above your head. Mm. So when you're, there's something about, it has like some little uh, micro weather system that feels a bit, um, always feels damp and close and yeah, it can be pretty grim. But it can also be beautiful. It's, a, it's I think it's a, it's a beautiful city. It feels like a song. That feels like it could be a song right there. Could be, yeah. Uh, I, I, have, I haven't actually written uh, a new song in, in a while, in a, in a couple of months. I've been more interested in instrumental music and uh, experimenting with, with tips and, and noises and just random stuff. So um, maybe maybe that, that could be my, my <laughs> song, something about Glasgow. Yeah, because yeah, I remember when I was when I was in Ireland, it almost felt like, uh in the winter time they like the weather knew when i was like coming outside and it would start raining exactly when i walk outside and then you go <laughs> indoors and it stops i felt like that the whole winter uh, yeah that's about right i think i think that's uh <laughs> that's a pretty accurate description of weather in 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 uh in this country it's although this week the weather forecast has been predicted rain all week mm. uh, which is a bummer, a bummer but uh it's been dry and sunny like every day, so I don't know what the weather forecasters are up to, but 
Um, they're just getting it wrong every day, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I love it when the weather forecast get get they get it wrong. It's like uh, I don't know. I feel like trying to something about predicting the weather feels uh, like um, blasphemous in a in a weird way. I'm not I'm not religious, but like predicting that it's going to rain tomorrow is like that's like playing God or like thinking you're above nature. You know what I mean? Yeah, so when, yeah. when weathermen get it wrong. It's like uh, it's sort of like a win to nature, you know what I mean? Like, ha, yeah. you didn't, you didn't, yeah. you didn't get it right. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, when you try to like predict what a person would do, and they do something different, and they're sort of like, "I told you, you couldn't predict what I what yeah. I was going to do." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess during those times when it is like raining for weeks straight, compared to like the summertime, do you find it? do you write different music in those times or do you, do you feel more inspired in specific times? That's a good question. Certainly the elements inspire me in different ways. And I write certain music. I definitely write different styles, different sounding music in the summer than I do in the winter. Generally in the summer, I would write in the spring, in the summer, I would write more, it'd be more rural themes because I'd be in the countryside more and enjoying the outdoors more. So I naturally would, the music kind of reflects that. Mm -hmm. um and then in the winter it becomes more urban and more closed and and claustrophobic and and sometimes warm and comfortable but but sometimes just kind of yeah small and uh just yeah it is different i never really thought about it but i I think that 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 might be true yeah because i i live in portland oregon in in the united states and we have similar weather patterns to ireland where it's very rainy and gray for about i don't know five months of the of the winter and it really gets you sometimes when you don't see the sun for like days on end it can it can mm-hmm. it can really affect your mood i feel yeah yeah oh absolutely uh it definitely affects me in a big way if i, if I don't I'm, I'm definitely affected by the weather and if i don't see the sun the, the blue sky i can get pretty down Transitioning to like your your music and stuff, the first I, the first song I heard from from you was "Whiskey Whiskey," which is a song that I I had on forever. And actually, a funny story about that: I was like listening to it before I went to bed, and I had on repeat on Spotify, so it just like played the whole the whole night. Um, so if you got a lot of streams one night from a specific <laughs> computer, uh, that, that was fine. Cheers. But, so with that song specifically, could you give a little background on like? how that song came about and yeah, just sort of the origin of, of that piece of music. Yeah. So it was one of those sort of rare occasions where I write the lyrics before the everything else. Um, mm-hmm. So it started off as a little poem, I suppose. And I wrote the poem when I was on a plane, just on my phone. So I was flying from Belfast to London and I'm not, I'm a terrible flyer. I hate flying. And generally I have a drink to kind of settle my nerves and it's, I mean, it's not really a, a good <laughs> habit to get into because you'd be flying at like seven or eight in the morning because those are where the cheapest flights are and, mm-hmm. and the earlier they are, the cheaper they are generally. And then you'd be getting into London at, uh, like half cut, half half pissed <laughs> and, um, and it's just very tired and drunk and sleepy and then you have to travel for another two hours to get into the center of London and it's just yeah. Yeah, a nightmare. But so I would, to ease my flight anxiety, I would end up drinking whiskey but this time in this particular flight i decided to write a song about or write a poem rather about this um situation that i've found myself in where i keep doing this and uh, as a way to kind of distract myself and as a sort of cathartic way to kind of get over what i was going through and it definitely helps to write down your feelings you know when when you're happening when you're when you're going through like an, ang- an anxious uh, moment to write down what it is that's making you anxious and write down your motives and your thoughts and just everything. And uh, it'll take you, it'll take you out of that sort of feeling. I do just write random thoughts down a lot Mm -hmm. on my phone. And that some of them end up lyrics and some of them just end up nothing. But do you ever look back on those things on your phone and be like, and not even know what it meant? (laughs) Like, do you ever scroll through things and be like, I don't even know what this is. Like I did that the other day. Yeah. What are, (laughs) what was, what was one of them recently? Can you remember that? Like caught you by surprise that you didn't even recall what, what that was about. I'll just get my phone out and have a look. I have one note that says, maybe it's good to be nothing again. I'm not sure what that, that means. I'm probably thinking about uh, dying and being dead and not existing. And like, uh, 
like the idea that you know you were nothing before this life and you'll be nothing again so maybe the idea it, it's kind of like a, a sort of like a self-comforting thing about um our mortality you know like uh maybe it'll be nice to be nothing again you know mm. that makes any sense yeah. yeah no it does i think about that all the time i think about because i'm i'm not a religious person at all and yeah it it is odd to because i have a very very strong fear of dying which i think a lot of people do yeah. um yeah. but it is it is an odd thing because yeah i mean i'm 30 years old and 30 years prior to this i I was just, I didn't exist. I was just nothing. And that was fine. Like, I, I, don't, I was fine then. So uh, I don't know why yeah. it's so, so scary now. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It's kind of, I don't know whether it's rational or irrational to be afraid of death. Because if you're an atheist or I, I'm more of a sort of agnostic in that, like, I, I think you can't really know. Right. Like, I think atheism is too much like religion in that, yeah. in its, uh, sure assuredness and it's you know self-confidence and 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 all that so I'm, i would say i'm more uh agnostic but like a pessimistic agnostic is what i would be <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. on that range yeah. yeah 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 but there's no real reason to be afraid of nothing doesn't really make any sense i was going to therapy for a while um a few years ago because i was drinking too much and and just to deal with sadness and anxiety and things like that and just drinking a lot and i was like okay i'm gonna sort myself out do some therapy and i talked about this a lot you know dying and mortality and stuff with with my therapist and i tried to explain he didn't share my sort of fears mm -hmm. but, um and he wasn't i don't think he was religious either but um I kept going saying but what about this and what about this and how can what about this and you know you're going to be nothing yeah it's going to be like nothing forever. And that's terrifying. Isn't that terrifying? And he was, his, eventually he just sort of was like, so what, you know, so what, what does that, why is that, why can you, why is that scary? You know, big deal sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, I kind of, I couldn't really argue with him, you know, like the, what he was right. Like it doesn't really make much sense to be afraid of something that isn't going to hurt you or isn't, uh, isn't painful or, um, frightening or whatever it's just nothing so i don't know it's weird the more you think yeah. about it the weirder it is yeah because i think i think my my fear is like the is the the, the dying when you know you're dying you know mm -hmm. so it's like have i done everything i wanted you know is is it going to hurt before I am nothing? You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. the process before that. I feel like that is, that actually is what my fear is. Cause yeah, afterwards it's just like, okay, well you're just back to where you were mm. at the beginning. So what's the difference? Yeah. But yeah, it's that little short window. I feel like that, that really messes with my mind. Right. Yeah. No, I think that bit's going to be grand because your brain just releases loads of endorphins. Doesn't it? Yeah. Hopefully fingers crossed. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what I've heard. I mean, yeah. like, if, like if, if you've ever been like so wasted that you passed out, I don't know, fainted or something. Yeah. That's kind of, or just like falling asleep. That's what it's like, really, isn't it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I've never, I haven't died yet, but um, I imagine it's a bit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's how it goes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess on that, on that topic of, of sort of, because I, I go to therapy. Pretty, pretty heavy chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know it could really took a turn. Um, <laughs> no, but it's, it is interesting because I, I go to therapy because uh, I have OCD and an anxiety disorder and like trying to sort that stuff out. I've, I've had it since I was a kid. I always find it interesting when you do uh, have a therapist sort of that you were talking about where you're just like, they're just sort of like stonewalling you a little bit, you know? I, I've, I've had definitely had those those therapists before as well. It, it's it can be tough, but I, I think, I think I connected so much with your lyrics, uh, because of a conversation like this and you, you seem just like a very thoughtful person. And so even, even song like lyrics, I know I wrote down some lyrics in, in your song, whiskey, whiskey, that like felt like they related to me so specifically, like even the front, like the, the chorus part where it's like the, the plane lurches, my stomach flips and I like to the cabin crew for signs of concern, uh, but they don't give much away. I was mm -hmm. just like, dang, that is like, I felt like that was my childhood, you know, and, and it related <laughs> so hard to like my struggles with mental health and things like that. Mm -hmm. So do you find, do people reach out to you about your, your music and about stuff like that, that, 
really, I guess, reflects them, but is in a, in a different way than you intended. I think if you're um, if you're honest and like, or if you write in a way that's not like, I mean that that lyric that you said there, like that 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 need to be reassured by an authority figure or mm-hmm. or parent or a or air hostess or yeah. whoever the person who's in charge of the situation is. I think that's so instinctual that you could apply that sort of to any mm-hmm. situation. Like you said, like you, it was like your childhood. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, if you were, describe, a, a, honestly, a situation that you've been in that made you feel sad or scared or uncomfortable, I mean, chances are people are going to relate to it, but because we're all such different people, we're going to relate to it in slightly altered ways. You know, we're all mm-hmm. viewing, seeing things from our own different perspectives uh does that like bring you any joy or like because i feel like what's cool about music is that you can write it with you know your own intentions and thoughts in mind in the specific situation in it even if people don't have the exact situation they can relate to it which is i think pretty incredible and sort of shows that we all are more similar in ways than we like to think Mm -hmm. sometimes so is there any specific stories that people reach out to you or anything like that Actually, there was a nice thing recently where I was on my PayPal account. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that people who had been buying my music on Bandcamp, or was it Bandcamp, or was it donating through Spotify? I can't remember either or, but there was an option for them to write a little note. Mm-hmm. And I could read them in my PayPal account, and I never noticed this before. Yeah. So I went back and I saw I had loads and loads of messages from like strangers just saying how much they like the music or mm-hmm. how much they like different songs, and it was like... It was really like uh, a, a real ego boost for my day <laughs> because I just had all this like unread fan mail. Yeah. Basically. And it was, uh, it's always lovely just to go go through and see. Yeah, I always find it really interesting how when people are specific, what songs people specifically like and why and which lyrics in particular. And a lot of the time it's not what I think it's going to be. And it's, you know, it's something more obscure than I expect. And, mm-hmm. and that's quite cool. I mean, maybe this is this is my own thoughts projecting, but does it ever get to a point where you the like the bigger the audience grows? Because I mean, you have a, a pretty large audience now. Um, is there ever any worry or concern or like even thought in your head of like, will they like this song? Like, is this going to be a good song? You know, for 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 them, like, are they going to enjoy it? Because that's yeah, that can be probably a tough headspace to to work in as an artist. Yeah, well, I think if, I think if you're writing a song if, if if i like it then i know someone else is gonna like it mm. so i'm just kind of worrying about whether i like it or not sure and yeah i mean there's some songs where i think about you know the intended audience but at the end of the day like you, ha- you have to like your own what you're making and if, you, if you think it's crap and probably is <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean when you're writing it i mean after i've written a song and performed it and played it a bunch of times and recorded it Generally, I'm like, oh, sick of this crap. So, uh, but like when I'm actually writing it and, and in, in the creative mindset, I'm, I'm, if I'm enjoying making it, if I'm enjoying making it while I'm making it, then I'm, I know that it, it can't be too bad, you know? So yeah. it's worth, to, worth keep, keeping going. Cause like what for you differentiates that thing? Cause you know, you, I feel like even you reading, a phrase on on your phone i'm like oh that that'd probably be a good lyric or something i feel like everything you write is, is really good so what uh differentiates it for you then because i'm sure there's a lot of songs where you don't finish them or you're just like yeah oh this is a sort of like okay idea but i'm moving on like what's the difference between those ideas and songs and the ones that you finish the ones i don't finish i either feel like i'm not ready to finish them in that like there's there's a missing piece to this puzzle that if i if i try and force it uh it won't it, it's not gonna yeah i'm just gonna wreck the puzzle piece you know what i mean mm-hmm. i have to just leave it and come back to it in, in a year or two and it'll have worked itself out sort of in my subconscious or something and then some songs you do have to just batter away at them until they, they fit but mostly if, if it's not working for whatever reason i just have to leave it and move on to another another song another piece of music and come back to it when when i'm in the right headspace for it yeah because i mean i as i said like i think your lyrics and your music are really incredible but is there any specific 
songs that you were surprised by the reaction of of people when you released it like you didn't expect the reaction that you got for for a specific song the most recent example of what you're talking about i just released the b-sides album there mm-hmm. uh a mm-hmm. uh, few days ago and um or a week ago and um one of the sort of singles on it was called higher places and i got a lot of really positive feedback about that song and i, I didn't really know if it was any good <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't really t- bad mouth my own music but uh <laughs> i was like yeah i just kind of put it out there and was like oh well whatever and then i got i got a lot of a lot of, a lot of people saying how much they like it so um i just yeah i never know what people are gonna and there's some songs you know where i release and i think this is gonna be great people mm-hmm. are gonna love this because i really like it and no one really gets it so i don't know what that means <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because that's a, such an interesting dynamic to me because yeah you, you don't ever really know um how people are really connect with anything in the artistic world, you know, it's mm. sort of uh it sort of is like the weather, you know, where you, you sort of put something out and you can maybe think that it'll do well or do terribly, but you don't really know until you do it. So, Oh yeah. We'll come full circle back to the weather metaphor. <laughs> back, nice. Yeah. Back to, <laughs> back, back to the weather. So on, on the album that you wrote that you recorded in Columbia, um, that you also won a Northern Ireland music prize for, I read that, that album uh you explore like ptsd and technophobia mm-hmm. is that something that you still are dealing with currently yeah well i think it's sort of uh not in, not in the way that i was back then um mm. i was in a quite a bad car accident when i was younger and mm. the sort of after effects of that rippled on for years and, and will always will but there was a lot of elements that kind of were bubbling around the time writing a lot of those songs and a lot of sort of issues I was dealing with that were related to post-traumatic stress and and then the whole technophobia thing as well I'm, I am sort of still a sort of technophobe and that I kind of uh, I'm terrified of the kind of world that we live in and mm. and uh, I'm t- it's more less technophobe but more I'm actually more afraid of the, the power that we have over each other now it's kind of mm. progressed and like this the whole data collection thing and and the capitalist surveillance and all that and mm-hmm. the control of big corporations and all that stuff. It's kind of terrifying. Not oh, that's very less so much the actual machinery than, right. the, than the people controlling it. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Yeah, because it's like, you know, if you get an iPhone, it's like they know everything about you now. They know, yeah. they know where you go. They know what you search for. They know what you like. They know what you purchase. You know, it's like, yeah. it's pretty terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, like when people like worry about getting the vaccine and they're like, oh, yeah, they're going to like plant a chip in my arm. And it's like, mate, if you've got an iPhone, they're already tracking you. They got all that. Yeah, they already (laughs) got that info. Yeah, they don't need any. They don't, they know where you're going. They know what you're buying. Yeah. Like, like, also, why would anyone want to chip you? You dumb fuck. (laughs) (laughs) That's, I know, that's the, that's the crazy part to me. Like, what do you think they don't know at this point? You know, like, what do you think they don't really know? No, I completely relate to that. I have a really, I have a lot of trouble with uh, even like social media because I just feel like I don't really want to be on it, you know, and I really try not to be on it, but it's, it's also such an incredible tool if it's used mm-hmm. in like a, a, a right, in the right way and like sort of balancing that for your own happiness and not seeing, cause it's, it's, a, it's such a weird thing. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, People that are growing up now, and even me, I'm 30 years old. So, I mean, the internet was around when I was younger, just not very fast. But people growing up now, they don't know how it feels not to know what everyone else is doing all the time, you mm-hmm. know? And mm-hmm. that's, that's I feel like it's such a, a detriment sometimes, you know, knowing what every single person is doing all, all the time and having access to that info. Yeah, absolutely. It's terrifying. Um, yeah, it, it's an it's a, it's a interesting conversation about about how much we need these things a lot of artists musicians like i don't think i would i wouldn't have instagram or facebook or or any or twitter or anything if i if i didn't think it was beneficial to my career like i don't right. i don't really use them for social stuff yeah i would never post i never post really pictures of myself in a social for a social reason you know uh i don't like it when people take photos of, of me i feel like we're all taking photos of each other all the time and it's kind of like yeah so it's sort of a you know, it's that thing where everyone was worried about, like George Orwell's vision of the future, you know, 1984. Mm-hmm. 
yeah. there'll be cameras everywhere and it's come true like, there, the camera, there, are, there are cameras everywhere they're just in everyone's hands you know right yeah so it's kind of yeah it's kind of it's just it's just like especially people just take photos of you and you know like friend, i mean friends and stuff like and they just mm-hmm. no one ever asks anymore people used to like it used to be a thing you get you get out a camera and you'd all yeah. stand together and take a photo and it would be like to mark uh, an occasion mm-hmm. but my people were just constantly snapping away and it's just like i just yeah it makes me a bit uh i don't know uneasy yeah no i understand that yeah because I was talking about this with my with my fiance too. It's like when people take pictures of their kids and post it on social media. Yeah, that's um, weird. I'm just like, this is this is not for the kid. Like the kid is not, this is not for him at all. So you, you, there's no consent here if he wants to be put on your Instagram account or not. You know, um, yeah, you're just doing it to to get attention and to get likes. Like it's not it's not. Because, you know, in, in back in the day when you did take out those big cameras and take it for a special occasion, you know, you would the most that would happen is you would bring those photos over to like a family function and be like, hey, look what we did. You know, um, yeah. they wouldn't be all over the Internet for eternity. So it's yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a weird place we're in right now, I feel like it really is. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is strange setting up like Instagram accounts for your children or I'm like just taking constant pictures of your babies and putting them everywhere. <laughs> weird i don't get it yeah 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 i don't know either but so with the pandemic and in i know as as an artist like touring is such a big part of of the of being like a artist and a singer songwriter so how have you dealt with the the pandemic and sort of you know tours being canceled live music being canceled especially being in a country you know like northern ireland where music in pubs and live music is such a, a big part of the the culture mm-hmm. how has that how has that affected you yeah it's affected me quite a lot um i used to run a, a regular sort of folk night in, in a bar in belfast that i haven't been able to do since uh, last year and a lot of my sort of social circles sort of surround centered around that mm-hmm. um that sort of lifestyle and i guess i'm a bit of a bar fly in that way so a lot of my social kind of interactions were based around that sort of world mm-hmm. gigging wise in the first wave of the lockdown you know last year from like about march till middle of the summer it was actually kind of nice to have a break from touring and gigging and mm-hmm. kind of recoup and because turn touring and playing a lot of gigs it's not very good for your health because you're kind of on the road sleeping in crappy places and mm-hmm. eating crappy food and drinking too much and, and all the rest of it so it was actually kind of good to get a break from that for a while and uh, just yeah recoup and um, and it's also given me a lot of time to work on other op- like other projects that I've kind of put on the back burner because I didn't have time to do them. So I did an instrumental sort of uh, EP with my brother Connor, which was which is called Shaklina, which is like a which means seven lines in Irish and it's sort of an Irish traditional post rock instrumental thing. And that was a lot of fun. And I also just finished recording an EP with a girl called Laura Quirk. Um, who's from Carlo and so it's just like stuff that I never would have had a chance to do if it hadn't been for the pandemic so grateful for that but now I'm really really itching to play gigs again I'm, I can't wait um, it just feels like it'll be the last thing to come back like every, everyone's talking about life getting back to normal here mm-hmm. for the most part that's true but for me and other performers it doesn't really feel any different because we haven't really been haven't been able to do what, what we what we do so it, yeah it's a bit frustrating and so i've really missed that quite a lot because it's real it was a real big part of my life and i wanted to i wanted to talk about the the instrumental group that you created with your brother i guess with, when making music with someone else rather than just making music solo uh what is the difference in like your mindset and how the collaboration works and how did that project uh, come about? Did you just ask him, hey, do you want to play some music together? Or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I said to, to Connor, like, I, want, I got this idea for like, like a, a sort of sound. And I just said, do you want to record, do you want to jam and record some music together? And he was like, yeah. And it was actually, it's been really nice because it's take, when you're collaborating and, you, and it's a band, you take, it takes a lot of the pressure off you. And Connor was mm-hmm. doing a lot of the engineering when we recorded we recorded um, a bunch of songs in Donegal. We rented a cottage and spent a week there and uh, just kind of riffing ideas over and over again until it started to make sense. And then 
uh, setting up a bunch of mics and just having at it. And it was been it was, it was so much fun because because it was a side project and I didn't have as much riding on it as much. It was just mm. pure music and pure fun and not worrying too much at all about what people are going to think of it. Just making it for the for the pure joy of creating something. And that was so yeah, it was really lovely. Yeah, does that that take you back sort of to why you started creating music in the first place and sort of give you a breath of fresh air? Yeah, absolutely. Because does your brother do, uh, is he in the music industry and stuff? Does he do engineering? Is that what he does for a job? No, he's he's, he's a drummer full time. He drums oh. for, session drummer for a, a bunch of different bands and artists and, <laughs> over the years. And um, But he's a, pretty, he's a decent engineer as well, audio engineer. He's, he's been doing a lot of that recently and I mean, between us, I think we, we should be able to record something half decent. Because <laughs> <laughs> so was he was he playing when you were a kid growing up too, or did you guys like have dreams of making making a band together when you were kids? Well, he we just we we always played together, but he sort of we didn't always we weren't always living in the same place, country mm. and stuff. And he had a different band, and I was off in Manchester, and then he was at home, and then more and more we played more regularly together. Because is it hard to? I mean, I've never, I have four or three siblings. I never collaborated with them on a project. Is it, is it different collaborating with your brother because of like the, the history and like how well you know each other rather than just someone that you yeah. really like? Yeah. I mean, it, I, me and Connor get on really well. We're best friends. So like it was pretty, pretty easy. I mean, there were, there were, there were moments where we got really on each other's nerves and we had to just take sure. a time out take a time out from each other and, you know, I'd go for a big long walk and let him cool down. <laughs> but uh, I can't remember why. I think we were, there was one particular track that was particularly awkward rhythmic element mm-hmm. to it that took a lot of takes to get right. And I kept mucking up the recording somehow and mics kept falling over and just things kept going wrong. And I think, yeah, we almost lost it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was, the, that was quite rare most like 99 percent of the time it was just a lot of a lot of laughs yeah because i mean i feel like that's a healthy way to to go and deal with things i feel like when you're with someone where you want to sort of put on airs you almost are like a little bit too nice when you're like really frustrated and it, it can get the vibe can get confusing you know yeah yeah, yeah i don't think I, i'd find it very hard to work with people i don't i'm not really really comfortable with yeah yeah making music is such a vulnerable thing too. So I feel like you gotta be comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have to learn new instruments or were you learning new, new new instruments for that project specifically? Yeah. I've been learning the violin, uh, for the last, well, just over a year now. So I mean, that, I mean, that was kind of one of the reasons why I start, I thought it'd be good to start a band where I'm playing the violin because I mean, that's how I learned guitars. I had a creative reason to pick it up and, and to write with it. I wasn't just learning it for the sake of learning it. So I thought I'll need like a creative outlet with the thing to keep me at it, you know, to keep me playing it. And so, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been really fun to learn something, something new. Cause does learning a new instrument like that, does it help you like get into a different creative mind space or like write different music, I guess that yeah. you would, traditionally with like a guitar or something yeah absolutely totally it, it changes everything even though it, you, you wouldn't think it's amazing how much it changes the way you write when you change from guitar to piano or to violin or banjo or whatever it is or drums you know starting a song writing the, writing the drum part first it's like it's one of the, the easiest ways you can mix up your your writing you know if mm-hmm. you're if you're getting, if you're feeling stale and you're not enjoying writing it, songs, just pick up a different instrument and have a go. Even if, even if you're you're crap at it, it'll it's so much such an easy way to refresh yourself. You know, refresh your songwriting. Yeah, because do you have a song specifically, not even just from that project, but a song generally that you're either most proud of or that you, I guess, love the most, or has like a really good story for you specifically? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, I was very pleased with uh, driving alone in the city at night from into the depths of hell, mm-hmm. as it was sort of the way I recorded it and the way I put it together is more what 
I want to create closer to what closer to like the the heart of what I want to I'm trying to get at sound wise and, and I, just the way the way I produced it I was the kind of weirdness of it I kind of enjoyed and a lot of it was accidental and just kind of a lot it was a lot of fun to, to, to mix it and kind of put it together like a weird sculpture and I want to write music more like that and I, yeah so I was quite happy with that when you when you talk about like sort of accidentally happening, uh, what do you what do you mean? Like you would just you're mucking around and you're in a state of play when you're when mm-hmm. you're making it. So when you make a mistake, like you go, oh, actually that kind of works, and you keep it in, mm-hmm. and then you keep making lo- more mistakes you make, the better. And like you kind of just keep take out the ones you don't like and keep the ones you like until it starts to make sense. Yeah, is that how a lot of your songs? Uh, or you're trying to write more songs like that or are more of them intentional and being like, I like these chords. I like this mm-hmm. lyric set. Um, I'm gonna make a song around it. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of both the writing process and the producing process is becoming more and more intertwined in that I'll have a very, very vague outline of a song before I start recording it. Mm-hmm. And then while I'm recording it, it'll kind of come it'll go a complete, might go a completely different direction to what maybe I had in mind, or I didn't even have it. I'm at a way I was, it was going to end or, or progress. And then the production decisions end up changing the right, like what chords I use or what lyrics I put here or how I sing them. And the whole thing is a jumble. And I like, I find that kind of exciting and uh, it makes for more, more sort of interesting songs, I think, because it's not just that standard verse chorus, first chorus, bridge chorus thing because yeah. do you have a do you have a favorite like memory of you playing music like live talking about like being away from it for a while is there a memory that has helped you get through the pandemic and get to the other side um probably i I, mean, I love playing big gigs but my fondest memories of playing music is in is in on acoustic or is acoustic sessions in the pub you know with friends mm-hmm. just singing old folk songs and those are my fondest memories the smaller, the smaller stuff, you know. Yeah, I can't wait to be sitting around the table with 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 all all the people that I love to sing with, and just sharing songs and sharing stories and sharing pints and having the crack. And yeah, yeah, that's what I'm most looking forward to. Because do uh, do your friends heckle you at all when you when you play intimate pub <laughs> gigs? Do they yell anything at you from the back? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I like a good heckle though, even if it's like. Even if it's bad, it's kind of good because uh, there's nothing worse than playing to an audience that is just s- staring at you and not <laughs> responding to anything you say, and it's yeah. just like really quiet and really awkward. I, I like to I like a bit of banter between, I like a bit of energy back and forth, and so even if it's like a heckle, I don't. I, it's something you know, it's something to latch onto and kind of have. You start a conversation then, and then it makes me feel more relaxed when I'm I'm singing, singing to people that are sort of responding to to what's going on on stage, you know? Yeah. Cause do, do heckles often happen in, in music? Like, is there a, a good amount of hecklers? I know it happens a lot in stand up, but I don't think it happens that much. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not like very common in the folk music world to be heckled at. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> normally it's pretty re- respectful audiences, which is nice. Just to wrap up here, where can people find like your music and, you know, purchase it and buy it and stream it? Where can people find all that? Um, so yeah, my website, uh, www.joshuaburnside.com, or you can go to my band camp and you can go to Spotify, YouTube and all the rest for streaming. But, uh, yeah, band camp is probably the best place to, to, to buy records and buy CDs and it's probably the yeah. best. And now that, uh, things are sort of ish or hopefully coming back to a more normal state where you can play live gigs, is there, um, plans to, like tour and go, go around in the, in the near future? I've got a little tour for the UK and Ireland just booked in November, um, so I'll be all I'll be all around the place, uh, UK and Ireland. But yeah, as far as further afield, we haven't booked anything yet because it's hard to say yeah. what's going to happen. But um, I hope, fingers crossed, next year I'll be able to maybe get over to the states or do a bit a bigger European tour. Uh, I'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. I really, really love love your music. And thank you so much for taking the time. And, and I appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks, man. Nice chat. <laughs>